the palindromes relate. Um, because when you start thinking deeply about, about with the thinking tool of a um, Big Bang, where the action horizon is where the action of the particles plays out, then from the center of the Big Bang, we can ask, well, is it, is it like the rotational center of the Elser Sloan quasi-crystal, where the center is the palindrome, right, um, of Fibonacci chains? Do palindromes play anything physical? Should we talk about that? I do not know. But that is a fundamental thing that is going to involve a lot of um, mixing with our intuition because when we begin to model a little bit of brute force type exploration where we're not sure where to go, but we model it using guides like the Empire window and other guides to control the types of modeling that we can do. And then we'll see patterns, we'll tap into our intuition and try to go from the bottom up. Okay. That once what we're looking for, what is the first object that we're looking for? Not a 20 group, that's trivial. What we're looking for is a pattern of 20 groups that is a complex pattern that, that expresses itself on the, on the three-dimensional expanding action horizon and has empire waves around it. And the empire wave, OK. The, the empire wave is the, f is the first physically realistic object. I mean, you could say it's, you, you can't separate the empire wave from the fermion, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 they go together. I'm just saying the empire wave seems to be both spatial and temporal, right? Mm -hmm. It goes forward and backward. Just want to confirm with you. It goes that. forward and backwards in time? Yeah. Maybe, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. um, because we're, if we're thinking of these shells, right, yeah. keep growing the shells. So overall, it's a whole quasi crystal. Yeah. So if I have a patch here, then it should go both ways. True. Because that's, that's what I have been bringing up with you about the retro color. You're, retro you're right. And that's exactly matching up with what Roderick Sutherland in mm -hmm. Australia has written with quantum mechanic equations. That's what Jack and Cinziana wrote about. And even Tony this morning wrote me a letter saying Jack Sarfati's back reaction quantum wave function is absolutely true. Mm. So you have a good intuition about that that comes from the first principles geometry. And, um, and then once you, once you have your first fermion particle, you have your first empire wave. Once you have your first empire wave, okay, now you can interact them in, in our early simulations to cause an electron self-interaction. An electron self-interaction is based on the trit saving, it's a, it's a quantum of gravity. A trit is a quantum of gravity, it seems, because every trit has a relationship relative to any other trit, which is the, the twist, and the twist is isomorphic to a quantum of Einstein's curvature. And so you either save a quantum uh, of, of gravity, or you or you lose a quantum of gravity, or you have neither interaction. In other words, we, we need a physically realistic explanation for electron self-interaction. That is, interaction with its own empire wave, interaction with its own electromagnetic field, which becomes interaction with its own uh, quantum wave function, or the definition of its own, uh, the definition of its wave function includes its, the energy landscape created by itself plus the energy landscape of every other fermion and boson. But if you model it and you remove the other fermions and bosons from the energy landscape, you're left with only the electron's own electromagnetic field to define the energetic landscape in one dimension for the electron. So in other words, the foundational quantum wave function of one-dimensional space with only an electron, so no, no energy landscape other than the electron's own field, then that is the, that is the stripped down, reduced um, quantum wave function for, for the electron. And, the, and, and that 
is defined by the parity, anti-parity, and null interaction relationships with the empire, with the uh, electron, with the quasi-particles propagation uh, playing into its own empire field. And then the second thing, of course, is the interaction between the two different empire waves from two fermion quasi-particles. So you can't really study this, not too much, until you get the empire waves, and you can't really get the empire waves until you invent or discover a quasi-particle pattern based on these empires of tetrahedra in the action horizon. So these are, these are the foundational tools, and because all of this object, this dynamic system, encodes under folding matrices the higher dimensional lattices and their associated Lie algebras, then there's no reason once we focus on these tools that at the end we should not expect to get what we want, which is gauge symmetry equations. Um, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm ultra reductionist, so I want to try to challenge everybody in our group, like Mike and everybody here, <clears throat> to restrict your thinking to the most limited set of tools and then only bring in additional assumptions if we have to. So here's the formalism. So describing this or having this in nature, we should understand there should be an infinite set, well, a very large set of formalisms which you could use to deal with this. One of the formalisms is to understand the dynamical network as a topological quantum network. And the irreducible anions are the Fibonacci anions. And of course, those would be very natural anyway for this type of Dirichlet integer neural network, topological neural network. So this is one way, um, and this is a diagram that I thought was nice because it's from a web page on anions and braiding, but they bring the braiding into a, into a more complicated physical system that is toroidal, mm -hmm. as we can see. Because normally when we see the braiding diagrams, they're just very um, simplistic. Flat, yes. Yeah, flat. <laughs> but this is a nice, way, a nice diagram. Uh, but another way um, to formalize and, and analyze and, and model th this fundamental behavior is as a tensor network. And this is a um, Perimeter Institute workshop on tensor networks. Uh, and so they drew their tensor network representation like this pattern here. Um, and Ray, you're probably not familiar with me in the past using a phrase called jitterbug waves. Fong is familiar. I use a jitterbug from uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller. Mm -hmm. But I, I um, advanced that idea into the, into the notion of jitterbug waves. Just like I take the empire and I advance that into the dynamical phase and, call, and imagine these objects called empire waves, where the empire waves are complex because of the stepwise spherical rotation combined with the forward helical. So the, so the empire waves are very beautiful and complex pattern so dynamically. This is a wave created by the oscillator when the oscillation is a jitterbug transform. It's okay. a jitterbug wave. Yes, yes. But uh, in case that's different than what I'm thinking of it, I'll say some extra words, which is when you look at um, a jitterbug, so remember the QSN is full of cubes, um, it's full of tetrahedra, and it's full of um, the root vector polytopes for the A3 lattice, right? The cube octahedron. So you can find these at any scale uh, in, in the, uh, the QSN. And of course, you can also find um, dodecahedra, icosahedra, and, dode and um, icosadodecahedra also in the QSN, right? And so you really have this object that is an interplay between the fundamental cubic symmetry uh, uh, periodic symmetry lattices, right, and the fundamental. Um, Just think about the cliff from <clears throat> from a tetrahedron to a icosahedron, for example, or or you know the from cube to dodecahedron. Just think about it's so from cube to dodecahedron, and, and then from another 
go to another cube and then dodecahedron go to another cube, right? You can have five. Mm -hmm. Basically, the oscillation has uh, not just between one object and another one. Usually, it's between uh, the 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 quasi crystal one. Usually, has the same phase, but this these uh, crystal one it can have five different phases or, di right. or yeah. So right. different states. Exactly. So you can oscillate the, you know, the full cycle may take, you know, exactly. five or twelve or whatever. So, so of course the jitterbug rotation is twenty-two point two three something degrees, which is, um, which is what we call um, J for jitterbug, and yes, so right. and we know that two times J plus our fifteen point five degree angle is uh, sixty degrees. We know, we know that the jitterbug generates the 15.5. So we know that we're working with the jitterbug rotation, whether we like it or not. That's part of our math. So what I want to tell you, Ray and Fong, for review is normally when you see animations of Buckminster Fuller's um, more, more local idea of a jitterbug transform, you're just looking at one shape change into another shape by the rotation of edges, faces, or, um, or, or poly, polygons, uh, polyhedra, right? You can, you can take the concept to any of the n-dimensional subspaces. Yes, he made the physical object. This is a sculpture from Buckminster. You can do it, though, with edge rotations, or you can do it with this face rotations. You can't do it with the whole thing. You, no, no, you do it with the subspaces. Yeah. So if you have a three-dimensional object, you can have three-dimensional subspaces, mm -hmm. like, like in our 20 group. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, we're compartmentalizing pieces of a, of a larger object into yeah. three-dimensional parts. <clears throat> yeah, but that's not jitterbug, though. It's a, it's a generalized... I personally am trying to generalize. So Buckminster Fuller thought of some beautiful... Um, idea in one expression and then we realized the similar concept in a very different expression than how he realized it and now I want to uh, invite you to imagine it in a conserved manner. What do I mean by conserved? Let us imagine that the total spatial curvature of the universe is conserved this, I did not invent this idea. There are many theorists who write about it if you Google conservation of spatial curvature. So that when you have a curvature here, it must balance out somewhere by a curvature over here so that the total curvature is some value, flat or some other value. Mm -hmm. So anyway, now imagine that I have a network of jitterbug transformations that are all connected. And when I have a jitterbug transformation here, it requires a jitterbug transformation over here. You can even see this idea in the Penrose tiling. You can, uh, can you see my, my gray lines back here? Okay, mm -hmm. so these are all, all of these are representations of curvature, right? Every, every edge was contracted from the Z5 lattice from a value of one by a factor of um, uh, two times the square root of 0.1. <laughs> so square root of two over five. Okay, so every one of these is a contraction expression, but every volume, right, these two volumes related by, these two areas, I'm sorry, related by the golden ratio, um, are different contractions of the area of the square faces of, of the uh, Z5 lattice. So if this one, if you were to force this one to, to be not contracted by that value and you make this one contracted by another value, it must be conserved. And so somewhere else there must be another one, right, that balances mm -hmm. it out. So the jitterbug intuition, the jitterbug wave intuition that I have had for a few years is the idea that one way to do a thought experiment to get intuitions on the dynamical behavior of the QSN is, is to think about, about rotations acting like waves in large groups so that the, the total waves which are made of curvature, right? They're made of, rot of rotation that's isomorphic to curvature. 
And so the total curvature must be conserved. And so when it is, it is never frozen, it's always dynamic, but it's always conserved, I think. And so, and so you should think about them as jitterbug waves because in the isomorphism of twist, you're, it, you're, or you could call it rotation in the native dimension, instead of rotating into the n plus one dimension, you rotate in the native dimension, and all of these rotations behave in a group sense as waves, and they're jitterbug rotations, literally, right? That's, that's the value, 20, you know, 22.23 degrees. So anyway, so, that, so the tensor network, which is just a very numerical, um, a numerical object, the tensor network must describe the jitterbug wave dynamism. Mm 